Hello Ragers, I hope that you're all doing well. Now, we've been pretty unserious on the channel lately, but I think that it's finally time that I use my massive reach and immense fame for the greater good to shed light on a situation that no one has talked about before. Basically, Wang has been living rent-free in the back of my mind ever since his return to fashion earlier this year. It's very perplexing to me as to how someone so seemingly highly regarded amongst consumers evidently fell from grace in such a short period of time. It's been a couple years now since the allegations regarding Alexander Wang were made, so I feel as if now is a good time to look back on his career, figure out how it got to this point, and briefly touch on the unfortunate exploitive nature of power dynamics in the fashion industry. So make sure to like and subscribe in order to support the noble cause of the FHTV YouTube channel. Our journey begins in 1983 when Alexander Wang first spawned in. Before his birth, his parents had immigrated from Taiwan to San Francisco and already had two children. His mother worked a few jobs before eventually starting a successful plastics manufacturing business with her husband. As a result of this increase in the family's wealth, Wang was able to experience a little bit more of an easier upbringing than his older siblings. RNG was on his side. When he was younger, he would often tag along with his mother to hair salons, and while waiting for her, he would flip through fashion and lifestyle magazines that they provided for customer entertainment. One day, he ended up taking one of these magazines home, reading through it multiple times, and then began to sketch out some of the looks that he saw. Subsequently, this led to him researching the designers featured and where they studied and where they learned to hone their craft. All of this, of course, eventually leading to him making the future decision to study at Parsons School of Design in New York City. His family had always been supportive of him, with his mom buying him his first sewing machine and encouraging him to draw. This is something that he would not take for granted, as he has honored his family through his work in the past. At just 15 years old, he had the opportunity to take a summer course at the renowned Arts and Design College, Central St. Martins in London, and ended up moving to New York City after completing high school back in California. At age 18, he took up a few internships with the likes of Vogue, Teen Vogue, Marc Jacobs, and more, thus ultimately leading to Wang deciding that he wanted to create his own label. So at age 19 and in his sophomore year of college, he made the decision to drop out, guided by his passion and confidence in his ideas. His family was supportive of this decision, as Wang and his sister-in-law, Amy, officially launched the brand in 2005. The support from his family would continue well into the future, with his mom serving as chairman for quite some time, and his brother and aunt would serve as key components of the company. But anyway, back in 2005, Wang and his sister-in-law Amy, who had experience in manufacturing, produced a handful of knit sweaters. Wang was pretty dead set on keeping the motif of having a girl smoking on the back of the sweaters and figured that would be the main, big staple of the brand, but that design only lasted a couple seasons. Regardless, designer Diane von Furstenberg caught wind of one of her employees wearing a Wang piece which she had fancied and ended up asking Wang to work for her. Wang actually declined her request, stating that it wasn't the right time. But in 2008, after winning Vogue's Fashion Fund Award for Young Designers, he also won von Furstenberg as a mentor, and thankfully there is no animosity between them. Before that, however, Wang debuted his first proper women's ready-to-wear collection for New York Fashion Week Autumn Winter 2007, and this of course received critical acclaim for obvious reasons. Wang gave his updated take on the influence of his predecessors, the collection featured various model off-duty-esque looks which the brand would become known for, it was very coherent, well put together, and ultimately commercially viable, selling to over 200 stores. Anna Wintour was a key supporter and evidently an early investor in Wang's work. She utilized her influence to bring attention to Wang. This of course led to him receiving the Vogue and CFDA fashion fund for $200,000 in 2008 as previously mentioned and he also won a couple more notable awards in 2009. Wang has always been keen on elevating the everyday. A lot of his designs have roots in sportswear and offer something that the average consumer can relate to. Basically, he wants people to wear his clothes, as evident by launching a second line in 2009 entitled T, which he claims is not a diffusion line, but it pretty much is. Wang debuted a collection of more accessible styles at a much cheaper price point, all of which still hold true to the sentiment of the brand. It is very clear that Wang is inspired by the youth and music subcultures alike. He was enthralled by the concept of encore performances, so for fall winter 2012, he basically saved his best looks for last and brought out a variety of models that he grew up idolizing. And of course, this youthful ethos coincides with the crazy and wild parties that he's known for throwing, between shows that have ended with performances from Ludacris, Lil Wayne, and Nicki Minaj, and the establishment of Wangfest, it is pretty clear where this party-goer fast-paced lifestyle reputation stems from, and we'll soon find out how that caught up to him. Moving on, Wang continued his career, debuting fresh, hip, and cool collections, gaining respect from the likes of GQ, who named him Best Menswear Designer in 2011, and opening up his first flagship store in Soho that same year. The next year, in 2012, he would replace Nicolas Gascaille at Balenciaga and bring his unique perspective to the iconic label. Wang has gone on record to state that initially he wasn't really prepared for this, given the fast-paced nature of the fashion industry and being preoccupied with his own namesake label, 
However, after talks with his team, he realized the opportunity and decided to take up the massive challenge. When, you know, when the opportunity first came, it was not something that I was searching for. You know, I, you know, I have my brand with my family that we own 100% of. And so, you know, there is a, there is a liberty and, a, and a, a comfort level to be, to have that, you know, and I was kind of, I was really doing a, a, a lot of areas, you know, and when the opportunity came, it was something that kind of, um, I wasn't prepared for, and so naturally my instinct was, oh, I'm, I'm so preoccupied with my own brand, I don't know if I can take this on. And the more that I, more conversations I had with Mr. Pinot and the team, um, the more my mind opened up. Although there were already preconceived notions associated with Wang, and despite a time crunch to deliver his first collection, Wang did his best and wanted to stay true to the roots and legacy of the brand, but put his own spin on things, of course. Despite turning a pretty substantial profit for the brand, Wang only lasted six seasons, leaving in July of 2015. This makes sense when you consider how spread out his workload must have been at the time. Imagine running your own multi-million dollar brand, entering a partnership with H&M in 2014, and having to design collections for one of the most notable fashion labels of all time. That is a level of stress and pressure that only fashion commentary YouTubers know. But alas, Wang continued partying, debuting collections under his namesake label, and eventually taking over pretty much full responsibility of his brand in 2016, succeeding his sister-in-law and mother who served as the CEO and chairwoman of the brand, respectively. Another interesting tidbit of information from that year pertains to when Alexander Wang was awarded $90 million in damages after suing a bunch of websites that sold counterfeit goods of the brand, although I'm not too sure if Wang ever received the money. This surely served to maintain vigilance. I'm sure it's truly impossible to find Alexander Wang knockoffs now. Regardless, despite his and the brand's immense success within the fashion industry, Wang still seemed down to earth. He would often appear in interviews where he came across as, as a very well-spoken, passionate individual whose sense of authenticity really resonated with fans, which is why what we're going to be going over next came about as such a great shock to myself and others who admired not just the brand, but Wang as a designer. Before getting into the big drama that came out at the end of 2020, it is important to note that Alexander Wang had been met with some controversy before. Issues associated with labor are still a critical matter to consider and something awful that occurs within the manufacturing side of the fashion industry. Back in March 2012, 30 employees who worked at the brand's factory in New York's Chinatown claimed that it was a ruthless, exploitive, and abusive environment. They stated that they were forced to work 16 hours a day or longer in a windowless 200 square foot room. As a result, they alleged to have suffered injuries and illnesses sometimes leading to hospitalizations. Wen Yu Lu, the at the time 56-year-old worker, brought these claims to light. He stated that he had been forced to work for 25 hours without breaks and was subsequently hospitalized for days afterwards. He claims to have been fired after complaining too much about working in these conditions. Hence, he decided to issue a $50 million lawsuit for nine charges that included labor law violations and unjust enrichment. Roughly 30 employees were added to the case, with the total cost of the lawsuit reaching $450 million. After catching wind of the lawsuit, a spokesperson for Alexander Wang issued a statement asserting that the company takes its obligations to comply with the law very seriously, including the relevant wage and hour regulations, the payment of overtime to eligible employees, and having a safe working environment for all of our employees. We will defend any allegations to the contrary. And after a few months later, in August 2012, the lawsuit would be dismissed by the judge in an undisclosed settlement, with the brand stating that they are grateful that this matter has been dismissed, as the allegations were unfounded and completely false. Although it is likely that the general public will unfortunately never know the truth, the lawyer representing the workers initially stated that these things are usually settled since there is a fear of bad press for the brands. Poor labor conditions are of course nothing new, especially with regard to immigrant workers who are frequently taken advantage of, which is of course super unfortunate and highlights the lengths that these powerful brands will go in order to basically min-max their profits. It happens all the time, and not just with fast fashion, but with notable brands as well. But this wouldn't be the last time a controversy involving power dynamics and Alexander Wang would arise. Some of this stuff is pretty sickening, so if you're sensitive to topics involving sexual misconduct, just be warned, and I completely understand if you have to stop watching. I feel as if we should have picked up that something weird was going on when Alexander Wang casted R. Kelly in his Spring Summer 17 campaign, but alas, on December 28th, 2020, a massive bomb of information pertaining to the many wrongdoings of Alexander Wang would be dropped by shit model management and Diet Prada, with each post gaining massive amounts of traction. SMM issued a statement claiming that Alexander Wang is an alleged sexual predator, Many male models and trans models have come out and spoken about the alleged sexual abuse that Alexander Wang has inflicted upon them. They continued in the caption, stating that it is time to do something in order to not let these occurrences be swept under the rug. We can't let famous people get away with sexual assault just because they're on a pedestal. They need to be held accountable, just like every other abuser. The post included eight screenshots of individuals sharing their experiences with Alexander Wang, as well as a video of model Owen Mooney sharing his story. 
Many of the stories coincide with Wang's partygoer persona. They involve Wang either encouraging the victims to drink, or even tricking them into unknowingly drinking molly water. A common theme pertains to the victims feeling pressured into doing stuff that they are uncomfortable with. Alex would prey on their vulnerabilities and attempt to take advantage of them while they weren't in this right state of mind. This coincides with the claims that he would target trans individuals as well as men. The trans community, of course, already faces enough issues with regard to assault and fear in general, and sexual assault where men are the victims, especially male models, often gets ignored. Basically, Alexander Wang used his anything goes, big party or ethos combined with his fame and influence to prey upon and take advantage of individuals who are in vulnerable states. I know Diet Prada misses the mark a lot of times. When they do shed light on severe issues like this, I think it's important to give them credit. The Diet Prada post serves as a comprehensive summary of events with specific regard to Owen Mooney's story. He states that in 2017, he was in a crowded club at NYC, and after being separated from his friends, he noticed that the person next to him started feeling him up inappropriately. That person, of course, being Alexander Wang. He was able to get away, but later on, one of Alexander Wang's friends pushed him into Owen, and Wang started throwing his hands around him. Owen kept silent for a while, but decided to share his story after becoming aware of the other instances of sexual assault and misconduct involving Alexander Wang. Another instance pertains to the experiences of DJ Gia Garrison, a 24-year-old trans woman who accused Alexander Wang of sexual assault in 2017 as well. She claims that while at a nightclub in New York City, Alexander Wang reached out his hand, grabbed her bikini bottom, and dragged it down in front of everyone, which is very disgusting and sickening. Continuing on with the Diet Prada post, they reposted all of the stories that SMM had shared, as well as a few others. Guys, this may be a crazy take, but personally, I feel as if it is important to believe and support victims when it comes to them sharing their experiences. I can only imagine the fear associated with dealing with something like this, and then of course being met with idiots online who know nothing about the situation and say stuff like this. Each situation is different and these experiences are very complex, so it is very unfortunate that many people are scared and worried to share their stories, especially when the person preying upon them is as powerful and influential as Alexander Wang. Bro is reaching Ian Connor numbers. But alas, Wang was quick to deny the allegations, claiming that he has never engaged in this atrocious behavior described. He stated, Over the last few days, I have been on the receiving end of baseless and grotesquely false accusations. These claims have been wrongfully amplified by social media accounts infamous for posting defamatory material from undisclosed and or anonymous sources with zero evidence and or any fact-checking whatsoever. I intend to get to the bottom of this and hold accountable whoever is responsible for originating these claims and viciously spreading them online. Obviously, it was not looking good for him, but later on in March of 2021, so a few months later after the allegations initially surfaced, Wang issued another statement which reads, A number of individuals have come forward recently to raise claims against me regarding my past personal behavior. I support their right to come forward and I've listened carefully to what they had to say. It was not easy for them to share their stories and I regret acting in a way that caused them pain. While we disagree on some of the details of these personal interactions, I will set a better example and use my visibility and influence to encourage others to recognize harmful behaviors. Life is about learning and growth, and now that I know better, I will do better. Comments, of course, were left off on this post. During this time, the attorney Lisa Bloom, who is representing 11 of Alexander Wang's accusers, stated that they had the opportunity to meet with Wang and his team. Apparently, they had the chance to speak their truth to him, and that they acknowledged Wang's apology and are moving forward. The cut asked Lisa about any compensation or agreement for the victims, but she refused to comment. Wang would step back from the public realm of fashion for a little while, but would continue to work behind the scenes. In March 2022, Rihanna would be seen in a custom Alexander Wang outfit, and later that same month, Julia Fox would praise Alexander Wang on Instagram. He would also dress Korean singer CL for the September 2021 Met Gala. It is evident that Wang was gearing up to come back. With regard to Wang's apology and meeting with the victims, communications crisis expert Richard Levick said, It took a lot of courage that the accusers interpreted it as authentic, and it worked. I find the way they talk about the allegations to be pretty disgusting and inhumane, basically with a lack of regard for those affected and a strong emphasis on maintaining profits. It's all a PR game to them, essentially. Ultimately, this of course led to the comeback of the Alexander Wang brand in April of 2022. Wang certainly played it safe and was reportedly unavailable for interviews after. He held the show in LA's Chinatown district. The event was titled Fortune City and played into his Chinese heritage. The clothes debuted were in line with the aesthetic that he's known for, and held true to the cool, accessible, model off-duty look. It's pretty clear that this was all a huge business move. It's speculated that Wang's online sales still doubled since 2020, and the business has grown double digits over the past two years, with pretty much all notable high-end retailers continuing to sell Wang's product. 
And of course, during this time period, Lang really started to target China, of course, being the world's biggest fashion market. And in September of 2022, Challengers Capital and the Yongor Group would agree to back the brand, with expectations that Alexander Wang's current annual revenue of 200 million would double within the next five years. So basically, after the allegations, Wang started targeting the Chinese market, where the allegations had gone pretty much under the radar among mainlanders. Alexander Wang has opened 13 stores in China across nine different cities. Obviously, Wang has acknowledged his heritage before and honored his family in the shows, but it's very convenient that he decides to go all in on this considering everything that was going on. I imagine Wang will stay clear of the partygoer vibe for a while and continue to focus on the Chinese market. Others have speculated that he'll need to expand into new product categories such as getting into the realm of hospitality if he wants the brand to continue growing. All in all, I think it's over for us fashion bros. I can't wear my favorite designers, I can't listen to my favorite artists, and I can't watch any of my favorite Minecraft YouTubers. All that's left is the FHTV channel. Thank you for watching, and I'm sorry this video was so serious, but I feel as if it's important to talk about these things and spread awareness for those who are uninformed. I'm breaking character here, but make sure to be nice and good to each other and to believe and support victims. Thank you guys for watching, and have a good rest of your day. Later, Ragers.